The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, our attendees from U.S. and Americas. And good day, time of the day to everyone else on the globe. My name is Max Kalamaitsev. I'm the Virtual Sand Product Manager, and today we'll talk about how to build a robust and fault-tolerant robo-solution using just two Hyper-V hosts. But before we start the actual webinar, I would like to double-check if everyone hears me all right, and if you have any issues with either video or audio part of the webinar, please let me know using either questions or chat in the GoToMeeting. Okay, one, two, three. Okay, at least three continents say that everything's fine and we can start the webinar. So, brief agenda of our today's event. First, we're going to talk about the actual robo-IT infrastructure. So, what's the big deal with getting ro a robust robo-infrastructure for your company or for your client's company if you're a consulting company. Then we'll look at conventional robo-IT environment, how it usually looks, what people try to do, what are the traditional approaches for remote and branch offices. Then I'll tell you how we can simplify that by adding virtual sand. Even if we add an additional component, we can still make it more simple without complicating. Then we'll have a quick look at features Starwind can offer and we'll also see Starwind Virtual Sand in action. In the end, we'll have a short Q&A session, and I'll also try to answer some questions while we have some pauses, if Starwind synchronizes or we're creating cluster and stuff like that. Okay, so with today's business, Robo has become very important because that's a lot of locations, there's a lot of stuff you need to manage those locations and usually that's the place where your business spins much quicker than in the head office because if you're a chain of restaurants your IT environment failed you cannot print bills to your customers you cannot sell anything it becomes quite complicated if that's a gas station no gas no many money you have not good. So basically, common robo problems, I would say four of them. First is huge amounts of hardware to maintain. Without a single strategy developed from the very beginning for robo, it's quite easy to get distracted because multiple offices will send you requests. We need a backup server. We need an additional server. We need a new server for that, for that, and we need a new switch. That really causes huge amounts of load on the central office and it's not a very good thing. Second thing is you usually need specialized stuff to manage each location or you have a team which just drives all day long and services your branch offices or retail locations. First two points introduce us to the third one. This results in your huge capex and opex. Maintaining a lot of hardware in multiple locations, just write the amount of money you spend on one location and multiply it by the number of locations you have. And then each year at least I would say 20% is spent on operating expenses for each location. Another thing which comes as a problem for robo is a limited scalability. Like a lot of locations do not have their IT environments built for being scalable. They've just built for one purpose, but then when the location starts to grow, you basically need to do a forklift upgrade of the entire location, often causing a downtime, but that's not a big issue. 
the bad thing is that uh, once again lack lack of strategy and quite hard to tell if the location will grow or will it not all these problems can be actually solved so if your robo environment looks like this I found this picture on the web and I'll tell you at least four of the branch offices I've seen look quite similar to that one so when we add Starwind to this we can actually make it more simple so if you look at this slide here two servers running Hyper-V and having Starwind installed can run all the virtual machines for the remote and branch office location. All the applications you need can run on two servers. They can be highly available and that's all. No stacks, no server racks for remote offices. It's compact, it's power efficient. There is not much needed to service it. So if we go at look at the bullet points of this slide, zero with the star hardware footprint basically means that you can use your existing service in the location and make minor upgrades or changes to the con hardware configuration and install Starwind on it. Then virtualize everything and you've got yourself a good and robust robo environment. Reduce CapEx and OpEx. We've excluded all servers, left just two of them. These are standard Windows boxes, so nothing special, nothing proprietary. Any Windows admin can administrate it. Even some folks which work at retail chains may be able to bring it back to life after a complete power outage or a disaster. Next point is complete full tolerance with just two servers. So there are multiple converged storage solutions on the market but a lot of them require three hosts to operate. We've made it a bit more simple. We use directly connected 10 gig links between two servers. These are not mandatory. You can also use one gigabit as your interconnect and the whole configuration installs in just two servers. So there is no need for anything else in this setup. Maybe just two switches to wire everything to your users, nothing more. And as I said, it's a Windows application, so nothing special here. During the demo, you'll see how easy it is to configure and manage the software. We go to the next slide. If we look at Starwind itself, the benefits it can bring you in a virtualized environment. First one is high availability. That's a feature which has been developed quite a long time ago for our software. And it's one of the most demanded features for converged storage now. Basically, if one server fails, second server continues to operate with no downtime, no manual failover, nothing. It just fails over continues to run. A new thing we've added with the version 8 we have just announced is the VM-centric file system or LSFS. Basically it takes all random writes, all the iBlender your virtualization environment puts on the storage and converts it into big sequential blocks. So instead of having let's say 75 IOPS from standard SATA drive, you can get much more than that just by making those IOPS sequential. The VM-centric file system comes with integrated deduplication and snapshots. For your convenience, you can always roll back. As we know, retail chains are often prone to certain things like weather conditions, power etc. So snapshots is a crucial part for this system. And also one more thing which is 
good for robo locations as WAN replication. You can always replicate your data back to the central location or to an archive location or to a DR location whatsoever. And for the organizations which cannot replicate like medical, government or military, you can use a virtualized tape library to get rid of the physical tape library and use standard SATA drives and on the hypervisor these SATA drives will be seen as a tape library and you can use your existing backup solution to backup to tapes which are virtual. One more thing for the robo office as I said it's scalability. You never know which location will grow and which will not. And Starwind gives you ease of scalability for your cluster. You can add one server, start the virtual machines, everything will run smoothly. Then when you see you, you'd like to have some more resilience in the location, you just add a second server, it continues to run. If you have more load, you add the third server and so on. And Starwind server cluster can scale beyond 64 nodes making it a very flexible and easily scalable solution for any type of load. Now, uh, I've already got some questions from our attendees. Let me just extend the questions window. Okay, so quick notes to the features introduction. Is it required to have 10 gig NICs or will 1 gigabit work? As I said, 1 gigabit works too. 10 gigabit works fine. You can also install 40 gigabits or 100 gigabits. The solution does not need a switch, so it becomes pretty much cheap compared to a conventional solution where you require two 10 gigabit switches between the servers to synchronize them. Then another question is if it is active active. Yes, Starwind offers active active storage. And one more question, can you install this on the free Hyper-V 2012 R2 server? Yes, indeed. We can install on the Hyper-V 2012 R2 server and that's not a problem. Okay, I'll make a small pause with the questions and answers here and move on to our demonstration. Just a second. Okay, showing the screen again. Let me know if you have the picture and we'll move on. Okay, great. So this is our management console for version 8. We have made it a bit more minimalistic, but at the same time it delivers much more features to the storage manager. So I've already added two servers here. From the very beginning you have servers tree and then you have your clusters tree. You, previously in the version 6 we only had servers and now we've simplified the management by creating an entity called cluster and once you use this one let's say HP test. This creates a Starwind cluster so not really a Windows cluster from the beginning, but let's see what functionality it provides. So for when you add the clusters to sorry the service to the cluster, it asks you which interfaces you will use for the synchronization and heartbeat, and then which interfaces will be used for heartbeat only. We'll select these two on the first server, let's say add another server, 
it found our second server in the environment and we say finish okay we've got our HV test cluster and instantly we can see the devices we have created in this cluster I've pre-created several devices and created the cluster for the demonstration and we can see it in this window if you want to add a new device to our cluster we just right click on it and select create clustered storage then we select which storage would like to create Let's say new VM storage and we'll make it 50 gigs go next we can create it either thick provisioned, this will create a flat image file, just the one we've used in version 6, or you can create a thin provisioned one and this will generate an LSFS device, which I've told about during the presentation. So this one is optimized for the VM workload. We can optionally enable deduplication for that one. I'll create one without the duplication. There is not much RAM in these boxes and we'll create a fully featured device a little bit later. Going next. Service to use for the storage. One, two. One intermediate question from on of our attendees. With only two nodes, how do you protect against split brain when all network links are lost and servers become isolated? Uh, there are several solutions for that. First one is to have multiple network links between the servers. And I would say from my experience, I never saw a split brain with four network links being on separate PCI slots. And one more way to protect is to add a controller node. Starwind version 8 introduces a controller node. This can be any device on the network. You install the controller node service on it and it will arbitrate which of the nodes will remain active and which of the nodes will be blocked in case when something goes wrong with the synchronization channels or heartbeat channels. But I would say 99 points a lot of nine percent. If your five network links are down, obviously your entire server is down. Another question is about deduplication. Is deduplication inline or post-processed? Uh, our deduplication is inline, so it's done in memory, and only then the deduplicated data is written to the storage. Okay. And here is our new storage device. Now let me go to one of our Hyper-V nodes and show you how we connect it. iSCSI initiator, let's see, refresh. VM storage new and VM storage new on the other node. So let's connect the local one, enable multipathing initiator and local path, and then the second one. Okay. 0174. Oh, 130. Actually, we can use this one here. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks for notifying. Looks like GoToMeeting did not pass through the Hyper-V host and some of our attendees 
still see the management console. And if we do it this way, okay now it's visible good so what I did I just went to one of our cluster nodes and connected our new VM storage in the ASCAS initiator the procedure remains as easy as it has been before we add the IP addresses of our servers to the discovery tab and then connect the targets we see here so then when we go to devices we see our HE device as a multipath disk inside two targets. Okay, the new storage is created and we can add it to our failover cluster. Oh, but first we need to connect it to our second Hyper-B server as well. Okay, make we connect it here. Nope, that's that's the wrong one. Okay. Initiator. and RBM storage. One thirty and one thirty three. Okay, that's one target and here is our second target which is local to this server. Good. Now we're finished adding the devices. Let's go and bring the disks online in the computer management. Otherwise our cluster won't see them. Online and initialize. Okay. and new volume on it. Next and finish. Okay, that's Hyper-V1 and let's add this disk on Hyper-V3. Management, storage and disk manager. Okay, but now it's easy. There it is. And here is our new clustered storage. Now it became available and let's add it to the cluster shared volumes. Okay, all set. It's now added to cluster shared volumes and let's move it to our first node and quickly deploy a virtual machine VHD on it. Oops. 
Let me first create one. New virtual machine and okay, install it here. Generation one, two gigabytes, and connect it to our virtual switch. We'll use an existing VHD I've put on our D drive. This will allow us to create the virtual machine a bit quicker. Uh, okay. Yep. Few questions from our attendees. Uh, this event is recorded and it will be available for download later. So if you have something more important something to fix, something to deal with on your primary objectives. Feel free to return to our website tomorrow or the day after tomorrow you'll be able to download this event as a recording. Also I'm receiving few complaints about the video quality from southeastern Asia regions and Pacific regions. Uh, I cannot really change the quality because it remains on the go to webinar service itself. So Usually, reconnecting to the webinar helps with the audio and video quality. Okay. So the virtual machine is created. Let's get it to the cluster. If I remember correctly, it should migrate it to the CSV or throw me an error. Yeah. Okay. The storage Oops, it's volume two. No, actually our new device is volume. Mm -hmm. And let's move the PhD to our cluster storage too. And in the meantime, let's see if we have any unanswered question about our product. Uh, what is the CPU load created by deduplication and is it scheduled? It is not scheduled. Deduplication runs all the time. The CPU load is minimal, but since it's happening in line, the deduplication requires about 4 gigabytes of RAM per terabyte of deduplicated storage to keep the deduplication table. Another question is, is there only one Starwind product left? 
Yeah, we've simplified the product line a little bit and now it's just Starwind Virtual Sen and it is available for multiple scenarios. We have Starwind Virtual Sen for Hyper-V, then Starwind Virtual Sen for vSphere, which is available as two instances, one where Starwind runs on dedicated storage and another one where Starwind acts as a virtual storage appliance inside VMware Hypervisor. Okay. While we're moving the virtual machines, let me also show you one more new feature with Starwind version 8. So previously Starwind HA only introduced HA with one layer of caching. With version 8 we have changed it and you can now create highly available devices with double layered cache with your first layer being in the RAM and second layer being on SSD. Let me show you how to configure it. We create a new device, hard disk device, virtual disk, let's say 40 gigabytes on our storage pool, thin provisioned Okay, without the duplication this time and let's say use 256 megs of write back RAM cache and then we've got our level 2 cache parameters we select write through this will be as fast as write back but this mode will also preserve our SSD's life cycle because doing write back for an SSD is not as effective for the second layer of cache. You can also perform write back, that's not a problem, but with this demo stand was doing a lot of write back, we quickly ran out of SSDs during our version 8 testing. <laughs> okay, our SSD is under letter F. Let me check what's wrong with that. That would be one. That's interesting. Size and number. Okay. Yep. Guess I found a minor bug. Okay, the new device is ready. Storage to L2. And now we go here and add the same device. And just quick check what was the size I used here. 40 gigabytes. And we add the same device on the second server. Virtual disk. 40 gigabytes. A thin provisioned one, but okay, no deduplication. Write back to 156 mags of level 1, 512 mags. You can also specify 512 gigabytes if the SSD is big enough. And change the storage path to the SSD. Why is that? Okay, let's check on the second server. I may have created a lot of 
layer two cache files. Nope. That's one completely free. Thanks for the notification from one of our attendees. My bug. Okay. Uh, we'll leave the device unassigned. Create it. And then we go back to our first server, right click on the device, click Replication Manager and press Add Replica. Then we specify two-way replication or one-way replication. This is the WAN replication we introduced in version 8. So we will say two node, specify the partner node's IP address, 168.0. 92. Next. And we'll select an existing device which is LSFS2. Now let's check the synchronization address and the heartbeat address. Okay. We'll just use this one. Go next and create the replica. finish. So this is also the process of scaling from one Starbin server to multiple Starbin servers. You have one Hyper-V server with local storage. You create one device and use it to store your virtual machines. Then you add second server and go to the replication manager and just add second server on the fly. Then it synchronizes the data and you can start creating the cluster and importing your virtual machines to the cluster. Okay. In the meantime, I guess our virtual machine has already migrated. Yeah, it did. And Let's move it here. Cluster storage. Oops. Mm -hmm. So we need to launch it first. While it's starting, we'll also connect our HA device with double layer cache to the system. Thirty-three and one thirty. And then this one here. In the meantime, a few questions from our attendees. Uh, current setup 
that I drive on the demo. Is it currently replicated across two servers? How about the IOPS? Uh, the IOPS you get from this system completely depend on two factors. One is the network link between two servers and another one is the disk's performance. Basically with SAS based rate 10 with good write back on the controller and about one gigabyte of cache on the Starwind side, we are able to fully utilize 10 gig link. I do not remember the exact IOPS numbers. I'll bring up the notes in a few minutes when we have the virtual machine configured and I'll be able to answer that one more precisely. Okay. Let's turn this off for now. Good. Hello? Okay, I'm sorry. I, looks like we had a temporary network outage. I'm now back. Apologize for the inconvenience. Okay. Uh, there was an issue with the VHD, so I will just go and quickly create VM 
we'll store it on our cluster shared volume, volume one, generation one, two gigs RAM and connect it to our network. And then browse for the VHD I brought there. There it is. Oh, okay, all set. Good. While we're loading, there are also a few questions from our attendees. Uh, we currently use SAS disks for primary storage and setup for secondary. How close does SSD level 2 cache with SATA disks bring you to the performance of SAS? Uh, actually, with the log structured file system, it easily outperforms SAS. But I guess if we take SAS and SSD and take LSFS on top of that, it will outperform SATA and SSD. So we're getting about three times more IOPS from the random writes pattern on LSFS. The reads are about as good as standard storage does provide. So basically if you take a SAS drive and its row read speed, that would be the read speed with LSFS. Sequential write speed would be about 80 to 90 percent of the physical disk itself. But the actual random load which prevails in the virtualization environments brings you much better performance than standard disk can deliver. One more question is, does Starwind solution support VAI and ODX? We added VAI support in version 8 and we're adding ODX in our upcoming service pack. So first steps are already done. Uh, uh -huh, not this one. Already. Ah, get my another account. Here we go. Good. So here's our virtual machine. I don't know why I turned it off last time. And let's do some load testing on it. Now, it will be quicker to get iometer from the web. So we'll do a small test. We'll start loading the disk with random requests and while I'm doing that I will turn off one of the nodes to show how it lives through the failover and then we'll resynchronize and see how the virtual machine fails over if we turn off the node which hosts it.
Okay. Here we go. Let's unpack it. We and we have our local drive, let's say 16 outstanding IOPS and let's create something different. 4K sixty to forty and about sixty five okay sixty six percent random is four kilobytes some read loads and big block loads as well So now while we're doing the tests in the back end, what I can do is go to the services and drop local Starwind service, which basically gives the storage to that virtual machine. So in this case, the virtual machine should fail over to the storage located on the partner Hyper-V node and continue working. Okay, let's wait till it finishes preparing the drives. Oh, actually, let's do it this way. I'll limit the size of the test file. 20 gigs. That should be a little quicker because with the formatted files it will fill up the entire disk space with the test file before it starts the actual benchmark. Is it doing anything? Yeah, it's actually preparing the, that file now.
virtual machine behaves kind of slow. Strange. Okay. Let's try to use this trick. No. Sorry folks, iMeter doesn't want to cooperate today. Let's do a completely small test file then. There it is. Okay. No, the virtual machine didn't like this window. Sorry for that. Okay. Downloads. Come on. Don't put shame on me. Sixty-five random. That. Okay. Done. So here is the random load we put on a SATA drive. So this is one layer of cache, so we have 128 megabytes of RAM cache on this device, and we're now writing 4 kilobyte mix of random reads and writes. In the back end, I'm dropping the local storage system to see if the virtual machine survives that and fails over to the second storage source, which is the partner cluster node. Okay, the node is now disconnected. This may stick here for a while, but the actual service has already gone offline. Let me get rid of the Internet Explorer and see what happens here. So we may see a few jumps of IOPS like here, and now it switched to the second server. Basically, if we look at the Starwind Software Management Console, it will say us that one of the connections is lost, and the M storage new, let me show it here, it remained on our HV3 server appears with a yellow exclamation mark showing that the partner is not synchronized. So let's see. Replication interfaces. Partner is down. No connections to the partner are present. But we see that this device has two iSCSI sessions and it is connected to the cluster. And our virtual machine continues running on the storage even if it is on the second node. Now let's say we would like to migrate this machine. Live migration to node 3. Let's 
maybe a little longish. Okay, continuous run. Great. So now if we get our storage system back, it will just automatically resynchronize and continue running. So there is no need for any manual actions to get the virtual machines back to resynchronize the storage or stuff like that. If we minimize this one and reconnect to the Hyper-V1 server, what we'll see is our devices are now synchronizing one by one. We'll start refreshing and showing that first device synchronized, second device synchronized, etc. And the virtual machine will still run. In the meantime, question from one of our attendees. Is it best to make many small devices for the virtual machines or a few larger ones? For example, in client setup, created one terabyte devices and chose those mounted as CSVs and Hyper-V and there are vir many virtual machines inside each device. Actually, that's a common practice and it's a normal practice. We do recommend to create the number of CSVs to be equal to the number of cluster nodes for one purpose. If you have two CSVs, they are primarily used by the owner cluster node and then there is no overhead associated with redirected I.O. or I.O. going through the network. With virtual SAN, you just have two servers and the CSV owned by the local node will work much faster because all the I.O. bypasses the TCP stack and gives you better speeds and better latency. Okay. VM is still working. I guess we can stop the iMeter test for now. Well, that's what we can see with sequential loads. That's the read speed from LSFS array. Then big writes. Behind this HA device, we only have one SATA drive and 128 megabytes of cache. So basically, that's the numbers we get by writing everything in big aligned chunks rather than writing small blocks instead. Okay. This one's finished. So I guess that's it for today's demonstrations. We're already taking a very long time and the event becomes longish and uninteresting. So I will gladly do more demonstrations of our features and I think we will do product features recordings and then place them on our website so that you could view it anytime when it's convenient for you. And now if you have any questions, I guess that's the right time to ask them. So we'll have a short Q&A session. Okay. Let me know if I may have forgotten any 
questions you and ask during the webinar and I will answer them now. Okay, uh, question from one of our attendees. In case of one of server failure occurrence, does the VM continues to run without restart or reboot? I mean to say if failure occurs with zero second downtime. This depends on Hyper-V. If your virtual machine runs on the first server and your second server failed, then there is no downtime for the virtual machine running on the other host. So the storage failover equals zero. But if the virtual machine and its hypervisor crash, then second hypervisor, in case of Hyper-V, needs to restart that virtual machine on its own. In VMware, this can be worked around with VMware's full tolerance feature, but Hyper-V currently does not have that feature available. It has high availability, so it restarts the VM. I guess they'll be adding full tolerance sometime soon. Now, one more question is, what's the price for this solution? Uh, unfortunately, I'm not able to disclose pricing on this event, and moreover, I do not have the pricing PDF available at hand. But if you send an email to sales at stubbornsoftware.com, I guess our sales folks will gladly help you with this question. Now, uh, that's a thank you. This is quite similar to my two-node Hyper-V cluster with Starwind Native Sense 6. Nice to see the new features in version 8. Yeah, feel free to contact us for the upgrade. Okay. And let's see if there are any others. Remote replication. Yeah, with the remote replication feature, uh, basically the question is, what are the requirements for the remote replication? The remote replication requires a WAN link between two sites and a licensed Starwind machine on the second site. Then it will be able to perform replication. You can replicate either from flat storage, then it requires two devices, two logical devices, so let's say D drive where your primary data is stored, and then E drive where the replica log will be stored. If the WAN link is slow, there may be some issues with the replication and the write log for the replica may become too big. So it requires multiple disks. Ideally, I would recommend staying tuned for new events on our website. And as I said, I'll be doing separate video sets for each feature, which will be much more comprehensive and have drawings for better understanding of the audience. I would like to thank everyone for attending today's webinar. Sorry for iMeter's behavior. I hope it was interesting for you. I hope it was informative. And have a good day, night, or the time of the day you have on your side of the globe. Bye.